Today we're going to learn more about the Powell family tragedy. I personally have been obsessed with this case since it came to the media forefront around 10 years ago. This video, although long, just barely scratches the surface of what actually took place. Josh Powell, father to Charlie, age 7, and Brayden, age 5, blew up his home outside of Tacoma, Washington, just south of Seattle, within just a minute or two of his sons running from a caseworker's car to his front door on Sunday, February 5, 2012. He pulled the children inside and locked the door. By the time the caseworker reached the door, she smelled gasoline and started pounding on the doors and windows. An explosion followed, and when firefighters arrived on the scene, the residence was fully engulfed in flames. Autopsies revealed that the father had actually tried to hit his sons with hatchet, a hatchet prior to setting while this end seems extremely tragic, it wasn't a standalone event for the Powell family. Josh Powell had been in the national spotlight ever since his wife Susan went missing from their home in Utah two years prior. Today we're going to look at the events that started the mystery on December 7, 2009 in Utah and ended in this tragedy on February 5, 2012. So Susan Powell was last seen on December 6, 2009. At around noon that day, she took her two sons to church and then walked home with a friend. That afternoon, another family friend stopped by to have some time with Susan. The family had pancakes and eggs for dinner. After eating, Susan felt tired and lay down to take a nap. The friend left, and Josh left to take the two boys sledding. At around 8.30, a witness reports Josh returned home. At around midnight, on a cold winter night in the middle of a blizzard, Josh thought it would be a good idea to take his two sons, then aged four and two, camping at the Simpson Springs Campground in Rural, Utah. When he left, Susan was allegedly working tirelessly to remove a red stain from the carpet. On Monday, December 7th, the Powell's daycare provider was concerned because the couple hadn't dropped the boys off. They couldn't be reached by phone or at home. She contacted Josh Powell's mother and sister, who called police after they failed to locate the pair. Police broke into their home, fearing they might have been victims of carbon monoxide poisoning. They found the house empty and noticed two fans blowing on a wet spot on the carpet. That evening, somewhere between 5 and 6, Josh returned home with his sons. Police found Susan's cell phone in his van, with the SIM card removed. Josh could not explain why he had her phone. He was taken to the police station to be questioned. When asked why he didn't drop his kids off at daycare or call his boss to say why he wouldn't be coming to work, Josh said he was confused, somehow thinking it was Sunday. The day after Susan was reported missing, while Josh was being interviewed by police, his sons were also being interviewed. When interviewed by investigators that day, her son Charlie, who was four at the time, told detectives that his mother had gone with them camping on Sunday and that for some reason she stayed at the campsite and did not return home. In a December 13, 2009 affidavit, police quoted Charlie as saying that his mother, quote, had gone with them but decided to stay there, quote. Months later, Chuck Cox, Susan's dad, said that the other son, Braden, drew a picture of a daycare, a daycare of a van with three people in it. He told caregivers that it was a picture of the family going camping. When asked where his mom was, his reply was, Mommy's in the trunk. A week after his wife had been reported missing, Josh Powell hired defense attorney Scott C. Williams and promptly skipped a third interview with the West Valley City Police. The next day, police announced that he had done this and said he was getting in the way of finding Susan. Later that day, Josh contacted Charlie and Braden's daycare provider and told an employee that the children would not be coming back and that she probably will not ever see them again. The day after withdrawing his kids from daycare, Josh canceled all of Susan's chiropractor appointments. He was then questioned by police, and this time they named him as a person of interest, the only person to be named so in this case. Ten days after Susan was reported missing, Josh cleaned out her retirement accounts. According to a warrant filed in 2010, police said that Josh Powell told co-workers at a company Christmas party, apparently just days after his wife had vanished, that in order to get away with murder, he would hide a body in a mine shaft in the west desert of Utah. 
He believed he could hide this from law enforcement as they would never want to search an unstable mine. By the end of 2009, West Valley police were looking into the Powell's bank records and insurance policies. Interestingly, June 28, 2009, just before his wife went missing, Josh took out a New York life insurance policy worth an estimated $1 million on her. The policy was worth $250,000 each for Braden and Charlie. Then on January 6, 2010, Josh and his brother, Michael Powell, packed up the family's belongings. Josh claimed to have been fired from his job, and he didn't believe he would be able to keep the home. He packed up his family and moved back in with his father in Washington. It was here that he claimed mental illness and instability had led Susan to run away. Later in the month, Josh would return to West Valley City to make repairs on the home so he could rent it. By April of 2010, West Valley investigators were documenting the very odd and strange obsession Stephen Powell had with his daughter-in-law, Susan. They noted that Stephen had offered to accept Josh and Susan Powell into his home, and Susan would become the type a type of additional wife with their, within his family to be cared for by him. In August of 2010, police contacted a West Valley City woman after her phone number appeared in Josh's phone records. She told investigators she had been in a relationship with Josh after meeting him through a dating service about six or seven months prior to Susan dis disappearing. The woman did not know him as Josh. He went by the name John Staley, nor did she know he was married. She only found out after she watched news coverage of the case. It was then that she was clued into the fact that his name was not John. She told investigators that she and Josh had sex five or six times in different areas of the Salt Lake Valley. Josh also gave her around $800 during this time frame, she said. The woman took detectives on a tour of the various places where she and Josh had hooked up, always during the daytime. On November 8, 2010, in an interview with the Salt Lake Tribune, Josh broke his long-held silence and explained what he thought had you know, started. I started out the day, frankly, thinking it was just another of two dozen times that they've done this. And over throughout the day, people seemed to think this was different. I mean, it's a different kind of behavior than the usual, and uh, if the police department is changing things that dramatically, you know, people thought that it was pretty serious, uh, something to take seriously, and so I, I realized that maybe, you know, maybe I've got some really good reason to hope. You're looking for a resolution to this, it sounds like. I would like a resolution. I thought it would be a, frankly I got the impression that they were talking about going down there and looking in a hotel or an apartment or something. I didn't know what to think, I mean, seeing the coverage this morning, I don't know what to think. It's. We discussed talking about the last year, what it's been like. Is that something you want to talk about? Something you want to address? What it's been like for the last year and a half for you? Well, you know, I've stayed focused as much as I can to take care of my sons. It's been hard. People, uh, people have behaved in some very uh, unacceptable ways. A lot of relationships have been destroyed, and, you know, on the other hand, I have a lot of support from a lot of people. I've never had so many churches supporting me in my life, you know? That's a, that's a nice thing, you know? Um, neighbors, people at my son's school, people various places that we frequent on any level mm -hmm. are extremely supportive and 
you know, I mean, it is really nice. It really doesn't make up for what people, what a very small minority of people have taken it upon themselves to do. One more question, because we agreed to keep this short. And with it, but what do you think happened? She is. Frankly, it's just not something I want to speculate on. I mean, we've talked about possibilities. We've talked about the possibilities that I mean, frankly, we don't believe the I don't believe at all, obviously, anything that these people that have been out there saying stuff, I don't believe anything that they've been saying, mm -hmm. you know. He said that Susan was extremely unstable and that mental illness had driven her to leave her family. There was a good chance she would return, he claimed. But for that to happen, her family and public had to stop looking for her. She knows she will be chewed up like a hamburger when she comes back, he said. He added that Susan's family had created an image of Susan that was simply too difficult for her to live up to. She can't come back with, with them treating her this way, he said. They want her to be perfect, a saint with no fallibility. Just a few weeks later, on December 6, 2010, Josh and his father Stephen made another claim about Susan's disappearance. This time, the pair claimed that Susan had run off with a Utah man by the name of Stephen Kutcher, who disappeared in Nevada in December of 2009. The Paul said, Paul said that the pair took off to Brazil, where Kutcher lived with his LDS mission. The pair had probably married and started a new life. It in fact turned out that Susan and Stephen never had a connection, and this was just another one of their false claims. Months later, on August 25th of 2011, Stephen Powell, Josh's dad, made another claim about Susan. This time he claimed that he and Susan had a romantic relationship and that he had become obsessed with her. Quote, frankly, after a period of time, a year or two after her approaching me and being the one that was really initiating things and trying to titillate me and get my attention, I became very interested in her. And on September 22nd of 2011, Stephen Powell, age 61, was arrested with 14, and charged with 14 counts of voyeurism and one count of possession of depictions of minors engaged in sexually explicit conduct. The arrest stemmed from the discovery of thousands of images of females being videotaped without their knowledge. They found this in their home, including in his home, including images of the missing Susan Powell. Investigators found the images after seizing computer discs while looking for evidence in the disappearance of Susan. Some of the videos featured victims as young as eight. Investigators said it appeared as though some of the photos were taken from inside the Powell's home. It is estimated that they were taken from June of 2006 to August of 2007 when some of the victims lived in the neighborhood. At that time, Stephen Powell was sentenced to a two and a half year prison sentence. He was released from prison in July of 2017. The boys, Braden and Charlie, were placed in foster care on the day of Stephen Powell's arrest. After leaving foster care, they were placed with Susan's parents, Charles and Judy Cox, on September 27, 2011. The children were taken away from Josh because his father, Stephen, had been arrested on multiple charges of voyeurism and possession of child pornography. Josh Powell, his sons, his sister, his brother, John, and Stephen all lived in the same house when the children were removed. Police could not be certain that other family members living in the home were involved in, that, in the same activities that Stephen had been charged with. On September 28, 2011, after a two-day hearing, it was determined that the Cox family would co continue to have temporary custody of Charlie and Braden, at least until investigators learned what Josh might or might have known about his father's activities. The fact he was a person of interest in his wife Susan Powell's disappearance did not help his case. On February 1, 2012, a judge in Washington state ordered that the boys stay in the custody of Susan's parents. In light of the raid at the Powell's West Valley City home that found explicit images on a computer, the court also ordered that Josh undergo a psychosexual evaluation by a court-appointed examiner. 
Josh did not take Liz in the custody of his son's well at all. It appeared as though he decided to murder them right after the court order was made. He withdrew around $7,000 cash and left instructions for his sister to pay bills. Whatever was left over was to go to his lawyer. Over that same weekend, he took all the boys' toys to Goodwill. Well, on Sunday, the boys, along with the woman who supervised the court-ordered visit, arrived at Josh's rental home. The supervisor said the boys were happy to see their dad because he said he had something special for them. The boys ran into the house, but before she could enter, Josh shut the door in her face, locking her out. It was then that she called 911. Morning. Hey, I'm on a supervised visitation for a court-ordered visit, and something really weird has happened. The kids went into the house, and the parent, the biological parent, whose name is Josh Powell, will not let me in the door. What should I do? What's the address? It's 8119, and I, I think it's 89th. Um, I, I don't know what the address is. Okay. That's pretty important for me to know. Um, sorry, I can't. Just a minute. Let me get in my car and see if I can, if I can find it. I'm, this, nothing like this has ever happened before at um, these visitations, so I'm really um, shocked. And I could hear one of the kids crying. But he still wouldn't let me in. Okay, it is uh, one. Oh, just a minute. I have it here. You can't find me by GPS. No. Okay, it is. Uh, But I think I need help right away. He, he's on a very short lease with CSHS, and CPS has been involved. And this is the craziest thing. He looked right at me and closed the door. Are you there? Yes, ma'am. I'm just waiting to know where you are. Okay. It's 8119-189th Street, Court East, 2 Alec, 98375. And I'd like to pull out of the driveway because I smell gasoline, and he won't let me in. You want to pull out of the driveway because you smell gasoline, but he won't let I you... Smell, he, he won't let me in. He won't let you out of the driveway? He won't let me in the house. Whose house is it? He's got kids in the house and he won't let me in. It's a supervised visit. I understand. <laughs> Whose house is it? Josh Powell. Okay, so you don't live there, right? No, I don't... No, okay. I'm contracted to the state to provide supervised visitation. I see. Okay. And, and who is there to exercise their visitation? I am, uh, and the visit is with Josh Powell, and, who's and he is the husband that I supervise. So you supervise, and you're doing the visit. Yeah, you I supervise, supervise yourself. I supervise myself. I'm the supervisor here. Wait a minute. If it's a supervised visit, you can't supervise yourself. If you're the I visitor, I do supervise myself. I'm the supervisor for the supervised visit. Okay. Well, aren't you the one make? Aren't you the one making the visit? Or is there another parent the one, that you're supervising? You know, there's, I'm the one that supervises. I pick up the kids with their grandparents. Yes. And then who visits with the children? Josh Powell. Okay, so you're supposed to be there to supervise Josh Powell's visit with the children. Yes, that's correct. And how did... And he's the husband of missing Susan Powell... How did he, how, this is a high profile case. How did he how did he gain access to the children before you got he there? Gra- they, they, I was one step in back of them. Okay, so they, they went into the, the house and, and then he locked you out. Yeah, he, okay. he shut the door right in my face. All right, now it's clear. Your last name? My name is Elizabeth Griffin Hall. Griffin Hall is hyphenated? Yes. And what's your phone number, Elizabeth? Um, this, this cell phone number is 360-990-9955. And what agency are you with? Foster Care Resource Network. And the kids have been in there by now approximately um, 
10 minutes. And he knows this is children? a supervised visit. Two, Brayden is uh, five and Charlie is seven. And the dad's last name? Powell, P-O-W-E-L, L. Two L. Two L's at the end of Powell? Yes. His first name? His first name is Josh. Black, white, Asian, Hispanic, native? He's white. Date of birth? I don't know. He's about 39. How tall? Um, 5'10", 150 pounds. Hair color? Brown. Did you notice what he was wearing? No, I didn't notice what he was wearing. Is he alone then, or is anybody I don't know. I couldn't get in the house. Are you in a vehicle now or on foot? I'm in a vehicle. I'm in a Prius, on, um, a 2010 Prius. What color with is the it? doors locked. But he won't, he hasn't opened the door. I rang the doorbell and everything. What, what color I is I begged him to let me in. Elizabeth, please listen to my questions. What color is the Toyota Prius? Gray, dark gray. And the license number? Um, I don't know. I can look. Seven five zero ZMH. Zebra Mary Henry. Yes. All right. We'll have somebody look for you there. Okay. How long will it be? I don't know, ma'am. They have to respond to emergency, life-threatening situations first. The first available deputy. Well, this could, this could be life-threatening. He went to court on Wednesday, and he he didn't get his kids back. And this is really I'm I'm afraid for their lives. Okay. Has he threatened the lives of the children previously? I have no idea. All right. We'll have the first available deputy contact you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much, Fireman. What is your name, please? 
I'm Elizabeth Griffin Holland. I'm the supervisor. Okay, hold on. Elizabeth, hold on just a moment, ma'am. Okay, so your last name is Griffin what? Griffin Hall, G-R-I-F-F-I-N hyphen Hall, H-A-L-L. Okay, and your phone number is 360-990-9955 is your personal cell number. Is that correct? on the same court. Okay, so you're waiting down the street at 8112, 109th Street Court, 189th Street Court East. Yes. Okay, and are you in your car? I was in my car. I'm standing outside it right now. Okay, is that your home? Is that your home address? No, that's not my home okay. address. I was the supervised visitation coordinator. I picked the children up. What is that person's name? His name is Josh Powell. Once the boys were inside, Josh, Josh took an axe and struck them both. Josh then scattered gas around the house, tossing it on the walls, floors, and ceilings. Before setting the fire, he emailed family and friends and even left voice messages. Uh, this is Josh. I'm, I'm going to say goodbye. I am not able to live without myself, and I'm not able to go on anymore. I'm sorry to everyone I've hurt. Goodbye. Josh then put a five-gallon gas can by the front door, placed another between his knees, and lit a match. An autopsy would later show that despite suffering massive injuries to their heads and necks, Charlie and Braden had actually died from inhaling carbon monoxide. Josh Powell died of smoke inhalation. Thank you so much for taking the time to learn more about the Powell family tragedy. Please click like and subscribe as there will be future videos in regards to this case. The cast of characters in this story are second to none and it's something I've been obsessed with for a very long time. I look forward to sharing more information with you. Have a great day.